Uh, I've never had a fully insured client. It's something no kidding. That, yeah, it's something I kind of say proudly. You and, got a clean uh, conscience. Yeah, man. and <laughs> maybe uh, ignorantly. <laughs> yeah. that, hey, I've never had a full, fully insured client. Hey, what's up, guys? Spencer Smith here, host of the Self Funded with Spencer podcast, sponsored by Pareto Health, Claim Doc, and PlanSight. Enjoy today's episode. Hey, I'm here with uh, Jonathan Lopez, uh, my buddy uh, who's with uh, Novo Connection now. We're going to talk about that amongst uh, other things as well. Uh, but Jonathan, good to see you, man. Great to have you. And thanks for doing a little more casual. Oh, no problem well. at all. Yeah, it, you know, it's always great to, to be on the podcast. You know, we text constantly, yeah. talk, hang out outside of, uh, of and work. And we've been decent about our trying to get together for lunch uh, once a month or so. Like, I, I, yeah. I failed a few times, but you've been pretty good at it. We got the dinner coming up, so we try to hang. And I'm glad we've become, definitely become good friends over the last couple of years. But we were talking off camera, right? You were on episode eight way yeah, back in it's the been day. a while yeah and i released uh with well, this is what september 26 today uh, yeah. yeah so i released episode 112 got you know 12 or so in the chamber so you'll be about episode 128 or something i guess like i that. wasn't good enough to come back quicker right? no that's not true <laughs> at all man you've had some changes in your career recently I that have, I, yeah. yeah we'll talk about as well but jonathan I, I stopped you a moment ago because i really wanted to make sure we were capturing what we were just uh, discussing on the podcast um Give me a brief bio, and then sure. I want to talk about your shirt, uh, and then that'll that'll start. The yeah, podcast. brief yeah. bio. Let's see. I've been at this for close to eight years okay. in the, the health insurance industry. Uh, I've never had a fully insured client. It's something no kidding. That, yeah, it's something I kind of say proudly. You and, got a clean uh, conscience, yeah, man. and <laughs> maybe uh, ignorantly. Yeah. <laughs> that, hey, I've never had a full, fully insured client. Um, but yeah, I've I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the the growth of the industry. I, I think we're we're making great steps from a technology standpoint, uh, from a health insurance tech standpoint. Um, I'm loving it. So you know, I I come from a educational background, having a doctorate, and I always say I'm an overeducated idiot. Mm -hmm. So just explain <laughs> stuff to me simply, and I will understand. I was going to go but, confirm, but that was a little <laughs> too harsh. <laughs> uh, so. What it really means is that I enjoy looking at data mm. and making a data-driven decision instead of, uh, you know, fly by the seat of your pants kind of decision Yeah, and, and having that. And I, I always say, you know, people always want to know, hey, how did you get to your position, mm -hmm. you know, in life pretty much? And, and I always revert back to, uh, I call it my, my oh shit moment. Okay. And I, yeah, I was in the Marine Corps and officer candidate school and I, I tore my shoulder. Okay. And I was sitting in Reagan national airport with 20 bucks in my pocket mm -hmm. and nothing in my bank account. I, I had payment issues while I was in officer candidate school where it didn't connect. And this is back in the day where there wasn't really an internet service <laughs> for your bank account and all that. So it, it's not like you could just log in and set it up. Right. So I sat there, 20 bucks in my pocket, everything I owned in a green duffel bag. And I thought, oh shit, what am I going to do now? Yeah. Yeah. And I knew I needed more education because, you know, I was more more than sure that the Marine Corps was not the career choice due to, due to the injury. They wouldn't let me back in. Uh, so I just kind of reduced it talking to, to friends on what do you like to do? Mm -hmm. I like to help people. So then I started helping athletes at, at Texas A&M with their academics and their, their academic strategy. So like tutoring a little bit or, well, not just tutoring, but it was, Hey, you're here to, to get a degree. You have a full ride scholarship. Mm -hmm. Let's look at what it takes to get a degree because we know the statistics of you making it to the NFL are, are pretty low. So let's yeah. prepare you for life outside of football. And you know, I coupled that into going into a master's program at University of Arkansas and then a doctorate program. And what did you, what was your doctorate in? Education. In leadership. In, with yeah, leadership. leadership. Okay. Okay. And from there, uh, you know, working while I was in graduate school, I managed a federal grant for the department of, of education to help veterans transition out of military hmm. and into college, which I even had an issue doing myself. Okay. Uh, you know, it wasn't, school wasn't easy. And it was difficult to get into grad school because I had a, a crappy GPA in my undergrad. I, I lived a, 
a heck of a college life (laughs) and my (laughs) academics suffered. So, you know, really trying to take all that in on at at the end of the day, helping people. Mm -hmm. And that's what consistently gets me from, you know, one career jump to the other, to, to handling different obstacles uh, in the way, losing jobs. And it's, you know, remembering back to, hey, you you came from $20 in your pocket and everything you own in a green duffel bag to yeah. where you're at now, owning a house and you know, being able to provide for your family. So things aren't as bad as they, they seem. Well, and what I would say is just the through line based based on your brief bio there is the effort, right? The, the effort yeah. that you put into things, right? Recognition, oh, I need more education. I need to go pursue this. This was difficult for me. I need to go help somebody else. Effort is a, is a sort of consistent earmark, I'd say, not just for you, but a lot of people, right? And I always try to stress that, right? You look at some of the people that have been on this couch, yourself included, successful in their career, and we get a snapshot of their them right now in this moment, not the previous 15 or 20 yeah, years absolutely. that it took to get them there. And almost all of them put in, uh, you know, an, I would say a radical amount of effort in order to get there. And so just, you know, I'm glad that's something that came up. So Jonathan, we're going to do a couple of things that are a little bit different. One, we went a little more casual today, I think yeah. both by design, but I want this conversation hopefully to be kind of casual around, we're going to talk about incentives, right? Incentive structures in, in the benefits industry, good and the bad, our perspectives on what actually maybe are proper alignments of incentives. Talk about artificial intelligence, technology, all those cool things. Before we start though, we wanted to discuss your shirt and we wanted to discuss what's on your shirt and kind of the mission behind it. So why don't you tell us about that? that sure, so I don't know if got. they can see it, but yeah, it we'll show it water quick. boys, I'm sure Nathan will cut to uh, you. water boys on there, dig deep. Uh, the water boys organization is part of the Chris Long foundation. Chris okay. Long's a former NFL player who played for the Patriots and the Philadelphia Eagles. And, you know, he, he started this trek every year to Tanzania to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. It's something that he wanted to accomplish he met some friends there in a bar where all great things happen. Mm-hmm. You know, a little fun fact, the Marine Corps was founded in a bar. Mm-hmm. So they decided, hey, let's make this a little bit more meaningful than, you know, just us climbing this, this huge mountain. I mean, it's, it's 9,346 feet of elevation. Okay. Uh, so it's a task. But they said, you know, how can we get back to the country of Tanzania? So they started to dig deep bore wells and... Gosh, I think we're over 30 wells now okay. in Tanzania, Chris Long Foundation is. So consistently giving back to them and understanding their culture and having an appreciation for their culture. So not well, just... Why, so, what, so tell me about, because you were telling me some of the logistics, right? Sure. What the importance of wells and sort of the lack of accessible wells. So give me some perspective on that. Yeah, we were talking earlier, you know, the average time consumption for a, a female in Tanzania is three hours round trip to go from their village to the well okay. to, to grab water, which is a necessity of yeah, life, yeah. and bring it back. But that water also weighs 50 pounds. Yeah, is the water like six pounds a gallon or something? Something like, like yeah, that. Yeah, so yeah. you know, having to bring that back for your family just to have water right. to bathe, to drink, to cook with, uh, to clean. It's, it's something that we take for granted here in, in America, for most parts of America, I would, I would say. And, you know, trying to give back to the, to the country of Tanzania. And there, there's a few wells in, uh, in Kenya as well. So what does it take to stand up a well? Like, do you have some of the data behind that? Like, you know, the, how much, you know, effort in terms of money, the depth? You know, do you have any, some of the, the numeric information on that? I'd be curious just to know the logistics side. Yeah, yeah. On, on the logistics side, it's, it's, if I remember correctly, it's over $100,000 to build a deep bore well. Whew. So, which is why individually there's, there's 12 of us going, we raise $8,500 each. No kidding. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, you know, we'll, we'll put a little link in here, donate to my campaign sure. to raise sure. $8,500. Uh, $8, so it's, you know, we're trying to provide the funds to cover the well mm-hmm. and to, you know, the main difference as well is there's communal buy-in from the well. So okay. we're not just building it, providing it, you know, without a funding source, without someone to actually manage it. So we're turning it into a business to where the, the village can have communal buy into it to say, okay. hey, we're charging for the water. We're charging you a proper rate for it. Too. Yeah. Okay. 
And then, so they manage that. Once that well is sort of stood up and open and accessible, then the, the local population would manage that? Or? Yes, okay, that, cool. that's, that's one of the main differences between other organizations that are, are digging wells is they just kind of put it there. Yeah. But then utilization goes to the side and, you know, who's managing maintenance it. Maintenance of yeah, it. Yeah, maintenance yeah. of it. I mean, you may have a for lack of a better term, local dictator come through and say, yeah. hey, I, I now I own, own the well, this, yeah. and now yeah. you pay me. Yeah. Uh, so having the community buy into it and then provide water. Well, what was it about water. this cause? Because I know everybody tends to participate or be involved in a cause for a reason, you know, below the surface, right? So what yeah. was it about this particular cause that connected with you? It, it's, it was an opportunity to be a part of something bigger than myself. Mm -hmm. And every year I set a goal for myself to accomplish something last year it was playing the electric guitar okay uh, i was almost a year ago so now I, I still play i enjoy it i've learned and i was like all right well what do i tackle next year yeah and i was i was at a, a veterans dinner talking to two other veterans that had done it before and they're like you know applications open right now mm -hmm. you should submit and and look into the to the organization before you submit and see if it's something you you want to be a part of and the fact that they not only do what they do in in Africa but they also have a, a domestic arm to their organization as well okay that helps provide water for more rural areas that don't have access to water don't have clean water I think we're all pretty familiar with Flint Michigan yep, absolutely and Jackson Mississippi and and now East Palestine uh, o Ohio even though a lot of people have forgotten about East Palestine yeah. and, the, and the train wreck that happened there and, and the chemical spillage. So, you know, being able to do that and, you know, be a part of an organization that's providing uh, access to water at, at you know, a, a reasonable rate and, you know, the stuff, some of the stuff they do here in the United States, they're providing school systems with water filtration systems so okay. they can fill up water bottles in rural areas. And, I'm still surprised that schools don't have water systems in, in their facilities to refill a water bottle. Yeah. I mean, I just kind of take it for granted. My, my son's school's brand new, so they have them all over the place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you and I were just talking about the fact that we walked down the hall, got some filtered water out of a fridge, and now we're drinking it, right? And you don't, you take that for granted. You don't even think twice about that, you know, especially right. like it's something you might understand with there's a well situation in Tanzania that's so far away, but you go, okay, I can understand that. But you start applying that logic domestically as well. And you, you realize it's in our own backyard is an issue too. So the other, the other thing I was going to say though, or, or ask you about is there's this element though of climbing Mount Kilimanjaro sure. that we haven't talked about enough yet. So what is it about you that the draw to that? Have you ever climbed a mountain like that? You know, are you prepared for that? I'm no, curious. never okay. climbed a mountain like that from, from the base to the top. So, I, I mean, I've been to Pikes Peak. I, I've been to the Rocky Mountain National Park, but you're in a car. Yeah. And you're driving up there yeah, and you yeah. kind of look at everything. So, yeah. What is the know, logistics just to get to the base of the mountain here? Like, where are you flying into? How far? So, we're flying to Arusha, Tanzania. Okay. And then we're driving, I believe it's a couple of hours to to get to the base. And, you know, we, we have a team. We're not doing this on our own. Sure. We, we don't have, we're not packing everything with us and then trekking it up the mountain. That'd be a lot more difficult. So you have Sherp, is Sherpas, right? Sherpas, yeah, 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 a guide, yeah. a guide company. So, you know, we're, we're taking that route. But the, the idea behind it for me was, you know, something physically taxing for seven to 10 days, climbing a mountain, I'm not necessarily oh, built so seven for, to 10 days. Yeah, huh? I'm not necessarily built for <laughs> uh, endurance. <laughs> I'm a more power explosion uh, kind of guy. So it, it's a personal challenge physically. Uh -huh. uh, and I would say more mentally as well. And, uh, you know, some of the, the, vet, the veterans that have been there before, some of the alumni have talked about how you, you don't train for the first six days. You, you train for the summit. Because that's when elevation kicks in, yeah, and that's yeah. when it's kicking your butt, and you want to quit mentally, and you don't think you can. What go is in. the weather like in February in Tanzania? Like, I mean, are you dealing with brutal cold as well? Uh, like, obviously near the summit, I imagine. Yeah, it's cold, we're looking but. at lows of about forty. Okay, so and, not horrendous. Yeah, yeah. And, then, and then highs in eighty. Okay, okay, all right. So, there's, so this there's is so an much, ice climb, though. Yeah, there's yeah. so much terrain too between the base and, and the the peak 
that you have to prepare for everything. So there's rainforest, there's yeah, other terrain, there's ice, there's there's snow. So you have to pretty much be prepared for it. Jeez. Anything and everything. So what is a uh, last question on this, and then we'll kind of move on to the insurance talk. Uh, you know, maybe we'll figure <laughs> out if we want to. Uh, but like, what is your actual preparation looking like? So we're in September, right? This is yep. in February, so you're six months away. What is your preparation right now? Training and things like that. What are you doing to prepare? Yeah, so they call folks like me flatlanders. Flatlanders. Well, we yeah, are in Texas. We're, we're in I mean, Texas. Yeah. We're home of the flatland. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I walk. I train. I, I do the stair stepper, and it's just. Increasing that time mm-hmm. spent walking, spent on the stair stepper, on the I have a rogue eco bike at home. I have a little home gym, so so a lot of it is cardiovascular based. A lot right? of it's cardi- cardiovascular yeah. base yeah. and building up endurance in my legs. Uh, obviously, that's what you use to to hike and yeah. to climb and walk. So I feel like if my my legs, my base is stronger, uh, it'll be an easier obstacle for me. I'm doing some breath training as well. Oh, what is that? Like, how does that? Uh, so do you know who boss Rutan is? Yeah. yeah, So boss created this, you know, that's the ice man, right? Or no, which, which one's the ice man? The guy that's that's Chuck Liddell. No, no, no. That, but the ice, whatever, there was a documentary about this guy that would, he could go, he would walk up in the mountains that are like frigid cold and he'd just be in shorts. And then he would like immerse himself in frigid water and breathe. I thought his name was the ice. Oh no, you're talking about Wim Hof. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, Sorry. Okay. So boss. All right. So you said boss. So boss is a former MMA fighter. Okay. okay. So early days of MMA was a a boss. Yeah. Could really mess some people up. And he was always known for his endurance. And okay. he's a huge muscular guy. So he he trains the expansion of the lungs and inter- intercoastal muscles mm-hmm. to really help breathe in more oxygen and exhale more oxygen okay. to, to you know train your lungs more and, and harder. Uh, so it's it's he has this little system that's like a four minute routine and it helps train your intercoastal muscles and your lungs to help breathe better and uh, I, just, I thought it was a good idea to do that for the elevation of, of the climate. Yeah, absolutely, man. Well, I mean, I obviously I'll, I'll live vicariously through you here, and I'll, I'm curious to hear about your adventures, man. I'm, a mountain climb, there's a certain element of, like, intrigue to me about it, but also there's a certain amount of, like, oh, I'll just I'll go watch a documentary about it, or Jonathan <laughs> can tell me his stories, you know. No, I'm, and I'm but a big risk-taker guy as well. I feel the same way about marathons. Marathon, so I, oh, yeah. I, I ran a you half marathon those, one time, yeah. and I said that was enough. Yeah, my wife's doing a 15K here in a couple weeks, and I was like, are you training for this? And she's like, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, she'll run three miles here and there. I'm like, babe, it's 15K. Uh, but no, she's she's an ex-cross-country runner and all that stuff. All right, well, let's move on to the insurance side of the house, right? We've probably been talking 20 minutes or so, and I, re- I appreciate you covering that, man. And again, if it, hopefully we'll get this out in time where people can still donate to the cause. When will the actually cutoff be for for? Um, this. Pareto Health is the manager of the largest employee benefits group captive in the United States. And it's also now the main sponsor of the Self-Funded with Spencer podcast. I chose to partner with Pareto Health for three main reasons. Number one, their dedication to improving the world of health benefits. Number two, their mission to reduce volatility and to make self-funding simple for mid-sized employers. And number three, the strength and scale of their program. With over 2,300 member groups and more than $1 billion of stop loss premium under management, Pareto Health is the most robust solution of its kind in the country, period. Stay tuned for more information because I'm sure I'll be featuring them on an episode of the podcast very soon. Visit Pareto Health at ParetoHealth.com or follow them on LinkedIn to stay up to date on the latest news and developments. So the climb is February 18th, 2024. So a day after my birthday. And, you know, we accept funds up until we go. Oh, up until you go. Okay. Yeah. All right, cool. So I'll, we'll definitely get this out in time and then we'll put a link in there. So if folks want to participate and donate to the cause and uh, maybe we'll even mention this in advance with another post that way we can get you uh, yeah, some be attention. Awesome. I appreciate uh, that. So, all right. So we want to talk incentives. I think you and I were brainstorming because we, we just kind of said, hey, let's do this podcast. We didn't really come in with a, you know, a total mission of what we want to accomplish. So we had coffee. And one of the things that we really got on, latched onto was the way that our industry structures incentives 
what that the bad incentives, if you will, what kind of behavior mm-hmm. that drives, and then maybe what is the optimal way to structure incentives sure. first. So when we let's just start with a baseline, Jonathan. Let's start with a problem. Like, what is the problem with insurance and uh, incentives in, in the benefits industry? The legacy way those things are structured. Let's talk about that to start. So yeah, I think the legacy issue is is somewhat twofold. It's misaligned incentives. Mm-hmm. And what, what I often refer to as dark money. Mm-hmm. So money that people don't know is being made off of the plan or a claim or a script fill uh, or you know a, a payment to, to a broker that, that now legislation has been passed to, to kind of uh, create the, the structure to not have circum, circumvention of that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think the misaligned incentives of, at the end of the day, the employer is the fiduciary, not the TPA, not the insurance carrier, not the reinsurance carrier. And they often don't know what goes into paying a claim mm-hmm. and who gets paid, mm-hmm. uh, what money is made off of it, what profit margin is in there. And, you know, having, what we'll say, overrides with stop loss and that not being disclosed or... You know, how do you come up with a PEPM? Mm-hmm. And then, you know, the old fashioned percentage percentage as your commission. Yeah, I was going to say that's the when we talk about the misalignment of incentives, that's the purest, the basis yep. for that is right. Is that because especially when you, you mentioned mostly self-funded plans, but obviously in the fully insured world, those have commission built into them, right? So the insurance premium yeah. that's being paid is, is built into that. And so because the carrier is the one paying the broker in the form of commission that is driving behavior, right? There's a whole old saying, he whose bread I eat is whose song I sing. And I'm not saying that a broker, just because you have fully insured business are doing the bidding of the carrier, but naturally because that is who's paying you. And because your compensation is built into that, it is going to shape behavior to a certain degree. You can be as ethical as anybody in the world, but it'll still shape behavior. And if your premiums go up, and you get a raise because your commission is a function of that premium, then there is less incentive, again, just human behavior, not not calling any individual that's listening to this out, but human behavior would suggest that there's less of an incentive to try to drive down costs if your commission is built in. So that is the basis, in my opinion, of where you kind of start to go down the wrong path. So comments or, you know, what's your opinion there, right? How How do you effectively manage a fully insured plan the right way without being at least even slightly incentivized by, by that arrangement? Like, what are your thoughts there? So I've never had to manage a full yeah, well, you plan. Didn't. Okay. So <laughs> but, in theory, hypothetically, in theory, if you did, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think just a flat fee, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, a PPM arrangement or a flat fee to, to have that group with uh, one of the, one of the bucas is, is the proper way to do it because yeah. your, your incentive is taken out. So you're supposed to drive the the best product for your client, mm-hmm. so which is reducing the cost of that product, which I think we both know that you can't really do that on the fully insured side. Yeah. You can't control the PBM. You can't control, there's no stop loss, but you can't control the premium. Uh, there's only so many things you can do in place to, to mitigate, you know, those tactics to, to lower the commission. Yeah. And I mean, if you look at it just on its surface too, right. And there's only so many levers you can pull when you're fully insured to save money on a plan, right. It's like, I I had the Tom Broker skit a while ago. That's like, Hey, you can negotiate super duper hard. You can strip the benefits, right. You can reduce the benefits uh, themselves, or you can shop and change carriers. And so all of those might potentially lower the cost of premium or take it down from here to a little bit lower level to reduce the overall premium amount. But every one of those there's a disincentive to the consultant to make that recommendation to a degree because why would you necessarily make a recommendation that causes you to get a 20% reduction in pay, for instance, right? And so again, I'm not suggesting people are doing that for that reason, but it is a byproduct of the being paid that way as well that there's less of that incentive to say, hey, this is absolutely the best thing for you and it's gonna save you a ton of money and it's also gonna make me lose a lot of money. Like most people would be- No one's gonna say that. No one wouldn't say that. When you consciously uncouple, I used that term earlier. What is that? Uh, I think Gwyneth Paltrow and her, whoever she was married to one day, they didn't get consciously divorced. Uncoupled. They consciously uncoupled. Yeah. But when you consciously uncouple comp from premium or from the actual expenditure to the plan, now those things are separate. 
They can stand on their own and you can do the good, which is helping drive strategy that lowers cost. And you can still keep yourself whole over here because your comp is not tied to that. Right. And Correct. that's what you and I are both, are, I think, are in agreement. Yeah, that's what we're in agreement on. I, we, we gave an example earlier over coffee of, you know, the the video that you posted about what was it? Gross. Oh, st yeah, yeah, stop your, loss premium. Your stop yeah, loss premium, yeah, your gross yeah. stop loss premium and including commission in there, you know, blows it out the water mm -hmm. <laughs> when you compare it to everything. You're like, well, let's just carve that out and don't have that be a, a variable of premium mm -hmm. and just pay that on the side if that's truly the, the commission structure you Well, like. yeah, and a broker that, let's say, they, they've done uh, some fully insured to self-funded transitions. They've obviously had a certain level of compensation when they're fully insured, but they're trying to do right by their client, right? So they help move them self-funded when it makes sense. But then they keep commission inside of the stop-loss premium. And now usually, you know, your, your, you know, your commission on a fully insured plan might be 2 3% stop loss to get that same equivalent of total amount might have to be 10 or 15 percent of stop loss premium the problem with that and what you were referring to is that the math when you load 10 percent or 15 percent commission into the premium it doesn't equate to 10 to 15 percent more of premium it equates to 15 to 20 something percent more Correct. of premium because that's how it's calculated there's expenses built into that and I, when I sh you know, shined a light on that a couple of weeks back, you know, I had not only, you know, people in the stop loss industry that were unaware of it, obviously some consultants were unaware of that as well. You show them the math and they go, oh, wait a second, maybe I actually <laughs> ought to consider doing things differently. Exactly. And so it's, it, they weren't acting in bad faith. It simply was a lack of awareness about how those things are structured. And I just think for all intents and purposes, if you can get commission out of those products and be paid in a different form, it's best for everybody. So Correct. we were talking about a fee for service or a PEPM. There's also performance based uh, incentives. So what are your thoughts around like a broker structuring some sort of performance bonus uh, of some sort? I, I love that structure because you're you're literally putting your money where your mouth is. Mm -hmm. Hey, I don't get paid unless I perform. So I mean, it's very much very similar to a professional athlete's contract for performance. Okay. If I score X amount of touchdowns and I'm an all-star and we make the Super Bowl, I get paid extra money for right. doing that because right. we as a team achieve that goal. And same thing on our side for the broker consultants. If you're putting in performance bonuses for you, hey, I helped you save a million dollars this year. Mm -hmm. Maybe you should write in 10% of that. For, for your bonus or 5% of that for your bonus in, in a structure. And what I'm saying is there shouldn't be commission or there shouldn't be incentives. It, it should be that everything's more transparent. Mm -hmm. Here's mm -hmm. how we get paid. Well, humans respond to incentives. We've been talking about that. Sure. So there's a way to structure incentives to get behavior that is actually optimized, that is good for everybody, right? It's, but we're talking about perverse or misaligned incentives as, as being an issue. It's not to say incentives themselves are inherently bad. They're not. Correct. I respond to incentives, right? I think we all do. That's why we work in sales. <laughs> yeah, right? that's why we work in sales. The better you perform, the more money. But you let's make. talk. Let's go one step further on that performance <clears throat> base, like kind of the structure of that, because that, you know I don't think most consultants are going to go all or nothing performance based. Correct. Comp, right. Yeah. They're probably going to have a baseline fee that they agree to. Let's say it's fifty thousand dollars. Then if I help you save X amount of dollars versus what we agree upon is was the budget we think is going to happen. But if I can get an overperformance with the strategy I put in place based on what difference it is, you know, that, that baseline to what we performed at, your, your plan performed at, I get a percentage or extra bonus because of that, right? That, that's yes. what you're saying, yeah. How have you seen that done? Is it a percentage of that delta? Is it an extra flat fee? You know, how do, how do you see that structured usually? The way I've seen it is, a, a, I guess, shared savings arrangement okay. is what okay. I would say. So I, I've seen consultants put it that way. And I... I've seen it utilize a lot more in the RBP space. Mm -hmm. So, ah. hey, we're saving you money. I'm telling you we're going to save 30%, 35% over what you spent last year, whatever it may be. If we hit that number, I get a bonus of 5% okay. of savings. 5% of savings, right? So let's say, you know, $200,000 with 10, 10 extra 10 grand. Extra 10 grand. Yeah. yeah. That's, and that seems like a really reasonable amount. Obviously, you wouldn't want to... 
I, I help save you 500 grand and I get 50%. I mean, may, maybe, I mean, maybe <laughs> an employer would agree to that. It's, it's between them, right? This is a private agreement between sure. two you know, parties. It's a voluntary engagement. So I'm not saying should or should not, but it, it is good. At least I like it on the surface to say, Hey, we agreed that with evidence that objectively your budget, we think it's going to be X. And because it became, it came in under uh, my role, you role, you role as an employer helping participate in, you know, saving money. I get a little bit extra money as your consultant as a result of that. I think that's Correct. a completely fair arrangement. 100%. I've actually heard, I had some guys on recently, uh, I think it was the Lockton guys uh, from Houston, great dudes. Uh, we had like a two-person podcast. Oh, nice. And they were, um, they were talking about, there's also the way that you can do it the other way, which is if the plan underperforms, my comp actually takes a hit. Right. So if we go sure. over that budget, so it can bo go both directions. That's an added layer of an incentive to, for them to perform, but also like to show, hey, if this doesn't perform as well, I have skin in the game as your consultant. I don't have a baseline where no matter what happens, I get paid. I'm actually going to lose money if I don't deliver on the promises as well, which I think is is kind of cool arrangement. Both both. Directions. Oh, I love that. I love that structure. Yeah. I, I think a CFO would jump on that opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, from the broker consultant side it's a way to save your client. If you're underperforming and they have a horrible year, they're usually going to listen to someone else coming in and saying, Hey, we can do this a better way. So if you, again, put your money where your mouth is and say, if we underperform, we get paid less. Mm -hmm. So our, we are incentivized to optimize savings for your plan and optimize everything for your company. Well, and it's not just the comp though in the medical side, right? There's obviously compensation built into other products. You and I were talking about sometimes consultants will go in and win the business because they're the cheapest, right? They, they have the lowest flat fee. The problem with that is that's a little bit misleading because they're getting compensation in other forms from other products that might more than overcompensate for that low fee. And so it, to the employer, it might seem like, oh, they're doing all this for really cheap. And they may or may not be disclosing the rest of their comp. So you said transparency is going to be important. Obviously, there's new disclosure regulations and things like that that are requiring that. So how do you see shining more of a light on that, changing the way that people are disclosing additional comp? Yeah, I, I think where I've, I've seen it a lot more is actually on the public side, like the oh, public really? entity okay. side, where you have those individuals that have a low PPM for the, their broker, broker consultant fee, and then they're making this massive amount of money on the VB side or on the, the other ancillary lines as well. And it's not necessarily that, that it's wrong. It's that it's, it's not equating to enough of a, a savings okay. to make a difference to, to have that added commission in there. Because what you're talking about from that standpoint is what? maybe half a percent of overall cost. Okay. So saying, hey, well, we're, we're cheaper. So we'll, we'll perform the same, but, in, but how much cheaper are you and the overall cost of everything? Yeah. And then cheaper too, right? Like I, I'm always wary of somebody that's like, hey, we're cheaper, right? Well, if it's a co pure commodity and you're cheaper, fine. But if it's something that has a lot of sophistication to it and you're quote unquote cheaper, what are you getting or how are you underserving me if you're cheaper, right? Yeah, or absolutely. What, am, what are you not disclosing in order to be cheaper than your competition who's maybe double or triple what you're charging me to do that? I'm, something doesn't equate. It doesn't compute there because this is a complex industry. I want to make sure that I caveat like everything I talk about with consultants. Like I just want optimized outcomes for the employer. That, that, that's my goal. Yeah. I'm not suggesting anybody's bad. Um, I also understand how difficult the consultant's job is. I've been selling into consultants for a decade. I'm very good friends with lots of consultants that are very good at their job. It's a hard, hard job. Um, but I think just having open conversations around this, right? Like what is optimal? What is creating the right behaviors? Where is the dark money that you kind of talked about earlier being, being hidden so that we talk about these things, shine a light on them, and hopefully – People that are hearing this go, well, you know what? I'm actually going to do things a different way. You you were talking about on the PBM side, right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of dark money. So one of the ones I think you were saying is that the the like per script fills, I think it's common uh, for a consultant sometimes to receive, yeah, to receive that. Per, per script fill. And, you know, when, when I was a broker consultant myself, we often talked about that, uh, about our competition. Well, hey, XYZ brokerage firm, we know they get paid three, four bucks per script. 
are they back in the pharmacy filling this script <laughs> themselves? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and it, it was usually with one of the, the big PBMs. But like, so how would you even good- justify? I'm, I'm curious. What's the justification for a consultant to be paid per script? I, I'm, it happens, right? Sure. So what is the, if you were to confront somebody or if an employer found this out and confronted their consultant, what would be the response from a consultant as to why they should be receiving a per script fill? Is there a good yeah, Response. I mean, I would say there is an expense when it comes to you know, the larger brokerage firms having PBM advisors in-house Okay, okay. to say, here's the formulary we need, here's the PBM we need to utilize, I see our specialty drug spend is going up, we need to discuss carving that out, Okay, maybe doing some internationally sourcing or some RX tourism, and let's really tackle it from that standpoint. So I, I see a, a justification for it. I'm not saying it's, you know, 100% wrong because there is an expense. And if you have an expense, there should be something to cover it. Well, and that's always it too. Like as a consultant, a lot of them have, they almost run in their own mini P&Ls, right? Like especially the consultants that have a bigger blocks and they have, they have their own overhead. They have their own team. They have their own expenses that they need to manage. And so some of these things are just a, a function of the fact that it costs them a lot of money to provide these services. So does it cost them the amount of three to $4 per script per employer that they advise? I mean, that's, that's a, a broader question I can't answer, but are you seeing because of that being exposed that those types of things are now going away? PlanSight is a complete game changer in the world of insurance brokering. As a broker, you know how time consuming and error prone the traditional RFP process can be. But what if I told you there's a better way? PlanSight is the only end-to-end RFP solution on the market made specifically for benefits agencies. It's like having a superpower that gets you an average of eight to 10 hours back per employer renewal per year. And the best part, PlanSight supports all carriers, all funding types, and all group sizes for over 20 different benefits. If you're ready to make your RFP process faster, more efficient, and more profitable, it's time to call PlanSight. Visit PlanSight.com now to book a free demo and discover the future of insurance renewals. I think they're going away or they're, they're being disclosed and, and lowered to a more amenable number of <laughs> yeah. $1.50 or $2, something somewhere around there. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, absolutely. You want to have that type of counsel, um, you know, like you want to get good advice on the contracts and there's a lot of money as we obviously know, baked into pharmacy spend. And just, I'm always just skeptical when you find out like, oh, there's a fee in there and oh, they're making a fee over there and they're making a fee over there. It's like, are you doing enough to justify the the absolute dollar amount that you're, you're making? Sure. It's always the question that needs to be asked. Well, we discussed it earlier within the PBM space on most PBMs owning the prior authorization company that adjudicates the prior authorization. So, of course, they're going to say yes to the majority of things that come in. Yeah. And then they charge $42 per script for that. <laughs> to prior authorize to their prior own authorize yeah, yeah, yeah. making their own money. Yeah. So they're yeah. like, check, approved, <laughs> approved. Yeah. And, there, and there, there are PBMs that allow you to carve that out and use an independent prior authorization company. Mm-hmm. I've done it. And, you know, they charge $12 per prior authorization. Okay. They're earning that $12 by making sure it's medically necessary. It adds up to what's, you know, what's being diagnosed. And yeah, this, this is covered under the health plan. One, do you think like kind of, we talked about the compensation structure for advising, but like a PBM is the optimized way for a PBM to make money kind of just as a flat. PEPM, like a monthly PEPM uh, for their services or, you know, there are additional ways that you see them making money that still seems, you know, fair, right? And that doesn't have perverse incentives built in. Yeah, I, th- I think it's all around the sophistication of the PBM. Okay. Are, are they taking a look at the overall performance and aspect of the, the PBM? So your prior authorization, your your rebates, is it you know, fully passed through, or is it some sort of shared arrangement of, of rebates? And I think we talked about rebates earlier over coffee as well, where there's all these intermediaries mm-hmm. of the, the pharmaceutical rebate to the actual plan. And there's a small percentage taken out each time <laughs> they pass that <laughs> rebate through. So you're not getting so 100%. Everybody's got their hand in the cookie jar. A little yeah, bit. everybody's got their hand in a cookie jar to, to do what? Pass yeah. paperwork. So you know, on, on the PBM side, I think... A, a flat fee is, mm-hmm. is, is a good route to go uh, with 
some incentive structure, just like the broker well, side. Well, I think what we're, we're just broadly speaking about is our industry, you know, going through an evolution a little bit. I don't know if you want to call it revolution, but an evolution sure. towards more uh, transparency, towards more integrity right in the way they get paid. You know, obviously the job of a consultant, this entire chain is so sophisticated now that it's just so complicated. But where there also is to, there is attention being paid to who's getting paid and how much is getting paid at each step of the equation. We almost need like, is, there's a PR problem, right? That the insurance yeah, industry has a perception of not only being boring and stale, which I think is incorrect. And I'm trying to do my part to dispel that notion. But also the flip side is that it's a greedy industry or there's a lot of people making a bunch of dark money and sitting in, you know, dark rooms, counting their millions. And Well, you're doing a great it, job with well, that, with the, with the broker character that you have. And, oh, and your Mr. Parody, Tom Broker. Mr. Yeah. Tom Broker. It's yeah. insane. Hey, yeah, you know, I don't, I'm off to my, I'm off to my cruise now. I'm yeah. off to my trip. Let's yeah. go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Just email to my assistant, <laughs> sign it, whatever. Uh, so I, I think you're doing that in a great way. I love, I love Thanks, comedy. Sir. I love, you know, how, when people use comedy to, to shine a light on some issues and, You've well, done a great to, job with that. They, thanks, man. They used to say, like, the court jester was the only one that could tell the king the truth, right? Because, yep. like, you use comedy in a way that you can actually deliver harsh truths as well. And that it's more palatable to somebody being delivered through that channel rather than being lectured, uh, you know, or just simply being a statement of fact. I just sure. love it, too. It's, it's a lot of fun to do that. Well, I mean, there's, there's a reason a comedian is the number one communicator. They're the soothsayer for of, the world, you know? Well, I mean, you look at Joe Rogan. Yeah. And he's, he's got the number one show on, within all of media, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, from the big studios of, of Fox and CNN and all that, more people listen to Joe Rogan. Yep. It's just how it is. He tells it from his perspective, and you know, he puts a comedy twist on it, mm -hmm. and he has a lot of interesting guests on. And yeah. I think that's what really drives interest. In, well, that was where my education. past affinity for comedy was as well, because I always feel like you could say some things that you would never say to another human being standing in front of you, but if you did it in a way that was funny, not only could you elicit a laugh, but you could perhaps tell a truth that would be very difficult to tell uh, with a straight face to somebody just, just face to face. So there was something about that medium that I love, um, and not to belabor the point too much, but no, I, I, I suspect the Tom Broker character will, won't be going away anytime soon. I hope it doesn't go away. I mean, <laughs> we'll get he, you doing, you can be Tommy TPA or you know, whatever. Tommy you TPA. Tommy TPA. <laughs> well, let's, let's kind of move to our third act, which we'll talk about artificial intelligence and technology in this space. You know, I think it's obviously... Right here, right now, AI is a buzzword in everything, but I don't think it's going to be any different for the insurance industry. I was telling you about a thing I was uh, became aware of recently using AI, but I just want to want your perspective, right? Like, what areas of the insurance industry in tech do you think artificial intelligence will impact? Yeah, I, I think it's really beneficial for the the pre pre payment of the claim process, okay, as well to. I mean, at the end of the day, artificial intelligence is looking at patterns mm -hmm. to help resolve an issue and, and answer a question. So if it's looking at patterns of all this data we have in healthcare, which there's trillions upon trillions of claims out there, and each individual, I mean, for instance, on my you know, health app on the iPhone, it has every single lab that I've done from Quest. So it has my blood levels in there. Oh, really? That's yeah. cool. Yeah. It, it has the data from my whoop on my sleep patterns, my okay. exercise patterns. So I'm able to take that data and say, I'm a pretty healthy person. Mm -hmm. And here's the data to back it up. Well, you can use data for the opposite for unhealthy people as well. Okay. On if you don't eat properly, you don't sleep, you, you know, work a, a very, cush job where you're at a desk all day and you you don't get up and you don't get any movement. Right, right, right. Well, it, you know, no wonder you have restless leg syndrome. You don't have any blood flow to <laughs> yeah, your legs. Yeah, yeah. You are short of breath. You don't get any exercise. So, you know, a lot of that will, will end you up in the ER room, which we know ER claims are horrible mm -hmm. from, from a health plan standpoint. And then, you know, you find out a year after all these symptoms started that you have a clogged artery, you have lung issues, you, you have other respiratory issues. Uh, so we're, AI is able to pick up on all those diagnoses. Well, so it's actually looking downstream for patterns of behavior or patterns in your blood work or, you know, 
I'd say con, confounding factors like you're sedentary, you work a desk job, you don't get enough sleep, like add those things together in an equation, you know, artificial intelligence might look at that pattern and suggest, hey, you're on the path towards hypertension or you're on the path towards diabetes, sure. right? So using that to perhaps intervene way before it actually becomes a problem to prevent it from becoming a problem, right? Is that kind of part of the equation that you're talking about? Yeah, that's part of the equation. So one of the first clients I had as a broker the population was the average population was a 27 year old male. It was a distribution company. Okay. Horrible utilization, horrible enrollment mm -hmm. on the plan. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't because they were all healthy. It was because they think they're Superman and they yeah. can't break yeah. and they're not yeah. going to utilize the system. Yeah. But the dependent utilization on that group was, was high because they were married. They had kids they're making decent money. So being able to, to look at a pattern and know that if my average population is a 28 year old male, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're not gonna have high utilization of the plan. So AI can look at it from the claim standpoint as well and say, here's the demographic. Mm -hmm. Here's where we see diabetes being more prevalent, male, female, or you know this age versus that age, and taking a dive into that and then we also talked about the, the post-payment part. The yeah, that was part. an interesting thing. That was one an application I didn't really think about. So tell me what your perspective on how AI helps with that. So again, you're just looking at patterns. And okay. now we have machine-readable files. We have the cost from a, a provider standpoint on what things are, what the discount should be, and being able to apply artificial intelligence to that to making sure you know, the diagnosis was medically necessary. And all the CPT and ICD-10 codes add up. And there wasn't an error. There wasn't an overpayment. So now you're bringing all that to, to fruition and saying, hey, we actually overpaid this claim. Mm -hmm. $50,000. Okay. So let's go back and collect that from the provider because we paid them too much. It goes back into the plan. It's usually a shared savings arrangement in there for the, the payment integrity company that's that's offering those services. And you know, even from a standpoint of underpayment, what if a claim was underpaid? Mm. Because all these medical coders, they're human. So yeah. they make human errors. So maybe they missed, you know, a quantity of ten of something. Maybe they, you know, forgot that they added this on or they hadn't, you know, I would say an extra day, but no one in a hospital is going to forget <laughs> a, an extra day. Uh, you know, different things like that. I, I think I've used, I've used this before, this example before a, a client had a $300 charge for a mucal retrieval system or mucus retrieval system. Okay. Uh, Kleenex. Box mucus of Kleenex. retrieval yeah. system. Yeah. Is box, a box of Kleenex. And how much was that mucus retrieval system, by the way? The charge was three hundred dollars. Three hundred dollars. Yeah. Okay. So you look at it on the surface, you go, "What's a mucus retrieval system?" And you go, "I don't know, but maybe it's some sophisticated." Okay, three hundred bucks. Yeah. But then you uncover, like, "Oh, that's a box of Kleenexes, right?" So, like, what do you in that situation? Do you just go, "Hey, you charged me three hundred bucks for a box of Kleenexes," or like, how do you actually reconcile something like that? There's usually a reconciliation process behind the scenes with whatever payment integrity company okay. is there. I mean, I. You know, I use the example of the, the box of tissues, but even for my son, we had a doctor's appointment. This was when he was an infant and they used a pair of scissors to open something and they charged us a hundred dollars for it. <laughs> and we're like, uh, uh, we didn't receive that pair of scissors. So is it a hundred bucks to rent this yeah. at the hospital? <laughs> Click. Uh, so I was yeah. like, this is ridiculous. So we fought it and they took it off. Yeah. But, but that's how, a manual. That's yeah. A how manual many of those effort. little things yeah. are done out there where artificial intelligence does that automatically? Well, and the one I was telling you about recently that I've heard of is uh, I got introduced to a gentleman named Chris Matthew, who's a founder. We overlapped at Sun Life, I think, a while ago, but he's a founder or co founder, excuse me, of a company called Sniffle. And they're using like, Di diagnosis tools, right? So you think think what you would have historically gotten from like WebMD, but would take you down rabbit holes because there's no oh, yeah. real intelligence. It's like whatever you put in, it's just going to respond in various ways. Whereas in it, whereas like a, even a chat GPT doesn't have like follow-up. It'll do whatever you prompt it to do, but if your prompts are wrong, 
you're going to go down the wrong path. Mm -hmm. And so what they're doing is taking, I guess, doctor patient interactions from a database fed it into this artificial intelligence tool. And then it's continually prompting you like, oh, you have a rash. Okay, where is the rash? Okay, how big is it? Is it red? Is it circular in nature? Did you go to the ocean recently? Could, you know, could it be a jellyfish thing? Like, so it's actually intelligently following up like a doctor would in order to investigate like where, what we think your symptoms are leading to in terms of a diagnosis. And then it turns that over to a physician, like for if they want to do a telehealth visit or something like that. But they have something like a 95 or 96% an accuracy rate in the diagnosis, which yeah, it's because it's looking at the pattern. It's looking at the pattern exactly. Of what what this may be, how it was diagnosed previously, and then narrowing it down, and then based on your responses, it's an algorithm too. So, like, if the response was, "Oh, I thought it was going to be this," but they actually responded with this. Well, no, that's a different path, right? And then sure. it's, it's it's pivoting. The only issue, just like anything else, when a human being is feeding a system, right? There's some bias, and there's some, you know, there's some. It's predicated on the information being truthful, right? Like sure, even we, yeah. even to AI, somebody might actually not disclose they are a smoker, right? And, yeah, and, we, I mean, we yeah. we discussed it a little bit about sniffle and you know that whole process. Artificial intelligence is is looking at that process and saying, "Hey, um, you you missed this, or you may you may have not have caught this because AI has passed the medical boards, mm -hmm. AI has passed the bar exam to be a lawyer, so it's aware of all this information, and that's how it's making its decisions. So it can, like you said, help. Yeah, but the, the thing provider. is, it's not replacing, right? That's not the big replacing. difference, right? Yeah. Is like this not doesn't have the design to get rid of the physician. It's just to arm the physician with better information. And that way, when they're spending their time with the patient, they can focus more on, okay, we believe actually this is right. Now let's talk about a course of treatment or let's talk about how to correct it. They're not doing that sort of investigation on the front end that takes time. And human beings make mistakes like we just mentioned. So a physician is prone to those mistakes as well. Bad day, didn't have their coffee. They're grumpy about something else. There's all sorts of things, a bias that a human's going to bring as a physician too. And it's just trying to objectively identify the problem and then give that over to the intelligent physician to make a recommendation. Sure. Kind of cool, right? Like, so that's where I do believe AI has a real future. Um, and then underwriting, we haven't really talked about underwriting. I've covered it in the past with Gradient and, you know, the Rover guys, Verikai, et cetera. There's really cool tools. We have our own in-house that we built at, at Pareto. It's inescapable now because there's mm -hmm. such an absence of data or lack of good data for, uh, you know, a fully insured transition group or a small group to go self-funded that you have to use artificial intelligence to underwrite it properly, right? Otherwise, absolutely, whew, it's a wild west and Good luck. some crap's going to go wrong. Yeah. And that's still being fine-tuned, right? I still, obviously, that's a work in progress. None of those systems are perfect. They'll never be perfect because we're talking about risk. The unpredictability Correct. of catastrophic risk, you know, is always going to be there. But if you can get a little bit closer to pricing and a little bit more accurate on which ones have a bad risk profile and have a good profile, then obviously you're, you're better off. ClaimDoc is a medical claim auditing and member advocacy company. We provide fiduciary services to employer-sponsored benefit plans, allowing them to create an environment where we ensure that the benefit plans are being charged in a fair and reasonable basis. My business is basically people, and it become a real simple transition. We thought it was going to be far more complex. I've saved, we'll say, hundreds of thousands of dollars. I could not say enough about ClaimDoc. And that, I mean, that's where I've been more successful in, in my current position. You know, yeah, working yeah, for thank you. Let's, let's finish an, there. Insure tech company talked about it yet. with Novo Connection. <laughs> so it's, you know, taking that data and being able to provide an actionable recommendation utilizing the insights that we're able to, to get from the data yeah. is crucial. So instead of just shopping to the market of A plus rated carriers on the stop loss side, we're taking that data and we're able to tell an accurate story of the group on here's the population, here's the history of it, here are some point solutions we're putting in place to lower their cost of specialty drugs, to lower the, the cost of inefficient, higher cost medical providers. You know, we have a transparency partner that we put in here, so now they can navigate the market a little bit better, uh, or we're utilizing quantum, things like that. So being able to plug that in and tell the story before sending it out, we get quicker responses from our stop loss carriers, and they're more appreciative with 
their their rates because they understand the strategy that is being laid out. Yeah, and we're we're of course working with the broker hand in hand on this. It's it's their strategy as well. well. And what we're I like telling about them, hey, here's here's some places we see the data leading us. What I what I like about that too, and you know, it's uh it's something you talk you and I are talking about over coffee, the fact that my last company, Plant Site, um, you know, there was an agnosticism to what they did, right? It wasn't that system was not designed really to layer in the recommendation or the strategy. That's not mm-hmm. the purpose of that system. You guys are doing a little bit differently, but you are helping build the story and the strategy alongside that consultant. And then that way, then you take that recommendation or that goal to the market with that story uh, as a part of it as well. So that obviously you hopefully get better stop loss terms, but that stop loss carrier feels like they're being involved in that strategy discussion so they can price it accurately and they can be in lockstep with you uh, in the consultant in the group as well. So I really like that. It's almost like a kind of the, we talked about evolution of consulting. It's kind of an evolution of what a general agent um, historically has been by sure. using tech to do that. And, you know, how would you, how would you classify what you guys do? Is it, is that, a, I would say we're an insurance tech company. Insurance tech. So, so okay. we're taking the, you know, obsolete structure of, of what, how we participate, you know, in the past shop stop loss and said, Hey, we're going to, we're going to take all the data and make some recommendations mm-hmm. and the, the broker and the client can either accept them or deny them. And then we can shop the, the market. But on on top of that, we are also, you know, helping implement the group as well. With those recommendations that I talked about, we're never going to say you should utilize, you know, we see that you have this renal disease on your plan. You should utilize a, you know, renal logic Mm -hmm. Mm carve-out. Well, we know most of the BUCA-owned TPAs won't do that. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. So we're never going to recommend that to, right. uh, to the group. So we'll, we go as far as the, the point solution recommendations as well to say, okay, well, you, you want that dialysis carve out or mm. you can't use any of the BUCA TPAs. Mm-hmm. They won't let you do that. Use some of the other Yeah, I almost feel TPAs. like the industry, and maybe you guys do do this, but has needed kind of like a, I don't know what you say, like this complex matrix to go, all right, well, if you choose this thing, now this pathway is shut down and you can't do these things. But these little vendors, you know, these point mm-hmm. solutions can be bolted on with it. So it's almost... That's exactly what we have. Yeah, you do that. Okay, so I haven't seen it, right? Full disclosure, yeah. obviously I haven't seen what you guys do. And I don't really perceive that you is, what you do is competitive to what I do per se. But obviously we have an overlap because it hasn't sure. made sense. Um, but like that, that the industry has needed that, right? Because it's like, oh, you want to do this point solution. Well, guess what? If you're using an ASO model, you can't. There's not really any matrix that anybody can go to today that's accessible publicly to go, what pieces can I put together or not? You have to find out through trial and error and through the grapevine sometimes to do that. So you're saying your system will tell tell the consultant some of that information. It will tell, okay. and it, it, you know, everything to almost mimic, uh, you know, plain Jane TPA to mm-hmm. your very innovative stuff. I mean, we have groups that we now have rolled out with a, a cash centric model. Okay. So utilizing cash pay up front instead of a network yeah. And be able to negotiate that. And then we, we couple that with a direct PCP. Okay. So being able to have that partner integrated into the system and saying, oh, okay, well, we see that you have this cash centric model. So we will recommend you to a provider that accepts that payment. Okay. And in Texas, huge. There's a lot of cash utilization here in Texas mm-hmm. and in North Carolina, a little bit in Colorado, Florida, um, not a lot on the West Coast. <laughs> but, you know, as you know, with the West Coast, they're big, fully insured, big Kaiser HMO, Permanente, yeah. Yeah. Uh, HMOs. So, you know, being able to look at that and say, okay, well, we see growth with a cash-centric model. So yeah. let's go ahead and create that. And here are the TPAs that you can utilize for that that understand the model. Well, I like that, that right? And so, like, if the end game is to pay efficiently – pay the least amount of money for high quality services, yep. right? Make the whole chain efficient. So there's a lot less administrative bloat and a lot of people that the bureaucracy that gets built in where, you know, we were talking about the inefficiencies of like coding, right? And having an individual have to go in and code everything and then send it to the insurance company and the insurance company has to check. And then there's a back and forth. And then maybe 60 days later, that claim gets reconciled and paid. And still there's things sure. that are missed in that equation, right? The closer you get to something that's the equivalent of cash, the more efficient 
efficient that transaction is going to be because both parties are agreeing upon a price. They're engaging in a voluntary transaction and they're receiving funds as quickly as possible for that service. Hey, the rest of the economy essentially operates that way. We're exactly. the only sector where it doesn't happen. So, uh, you know, kind of let's land the plane here, Jonathan, uh, you know, uh, not moving on from Nova Connection, but obviously some of what you do is, is the technology side, the stop loss procurement side. So obviously strategy is part of it. Is there an underwriting component component as well? Do you guys do any underwriting or pre underwriting for the case? Yeah, I would say we do pre underwriting okay. again to tell that story to our stop loss partners on here's kind of what we're looking at. Here's the loss ratio. Here's here are the outstanding large claimants. Okay. And the large claimants we predict are going to continue um, to doing some of that legwork. Uh, I think that's why we have a great relationship with our stop loss. And do you carriers. do some help on the clinical side when it gets time to firming rates and getting through some like, you know, bad risk and stuff like, um, you know, laser mitigation and stuff like that? Do you guys help there? Yeah, we, we help discuss those strategies with the broker and the client. On, yeah. Here's some of the stuff you, you want to do and uh, looking at things such as, you know, sometimes even looking at compassionate care as an option. Okay. So, you know, utilizing our partners out there for that to, to get that individual off the plan because it's costing the plan so much. Mm. But under... I never you know, heard that term, compassionate care. Compassionate care. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Okay. So, so being able to take that person off of the plan and provide them a, a public sector plan, so mm. a government plan that is fully covered under compliance rules and, and you know, it saves the company. Well, that's actually, I, so I hadn't heard that term, but that's actually a subject I covered. The episode's not out yet, but by the time this airs, it will be um, something called the Samaritan Fund that, that does, uh, you know, something similar. I don't think yeah, they, they do a great it, job. Yeah, I don't think they call it compassionate care. That wasn't a term that uh, Brett used. But anyways, like that's a new area like that has completely opened up my eyes to what's possible, right, of, about compliantly trying to get, I don't quote, bad risk, right? But the largest risk, the people with ongoing issues, right? Find a solution that's workable for everybody. I just hadn't heard that term, so I don't no, well, yeah, yeah. When, when you look at when you look at that area on what you're trying to accomplish, you realize this is a mid-market company and this million dollar claim is gonna kill the company. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. They they can't they can't keep the lights on if they continue to pay this right, claim. Right. So how do we not kick the person off the plan right. and provide them zero insurance because they qualify per our eligibility guidelines. You know, let's find them an alternate route. So one, we can keep our company open mm -hmm. and that person continues to get care. But if the opposite happened, you'd have all the employees without health care. Right, 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 right. That's uh, that's clearly not the desirable outcome uh, there. Well, why don't we, uh, let's uh, land the plane here, John. Um, kind of big picture health care real quick, and then your closing thoughts, man. I mean, obviously, you've seen quite a bit of the industry. Um, you have different perspectives than I do since you've been in the TPA world. I've never sat in that world. But uh, you, know, you, you and I have some mutual friends that are obviously really influential in the consulting world as well. What are you thinking, uh, you know, near future here w w with health care? I, I see a lot more adoption of, of AI okay. and insurance tech in general, okay. being able to show a more efficient way and, and a more cost efficient as well as time efficient way of doing things and, and saving people time to tackle other areas, but pro providing those data driven decisions mm -hmm. or, or those actionable recommendations is, is the term I use in, in conjunction with that. So, you know, being able to have uh, options of what to do next is really, really the next step in our industry because where we've seen it traditionally is here are your four options. B U C A. Mm -hmm. One of those. So let's think outside the box and either, you know, leverage one of those for certain things that they do good and, and put some other stuff in there for things that we think they don't do as mm -hmm. well. And or just not use them at all. At all. And I, I've seen brokers do that. And I, I think the the route that you can tackle that with has to be driven by technology or to be very labor intensive to, to go that route. Because let's be honest, the, the bukas make it easy for people. Mm -hmm. So you click yes, you sign, and boom. Pay your premium, you have, you you're have, good. Pay your premium, yeah. you have a plan yeah. the next day. So, you know, how do you say it's going to be a little bit more work mm -hmm. and, and do that? And it's the insurance tech department of our industry and saying, hey, we have it set up. Here's how it works. You know, 
so on and so forth, and continuing to innovate with with artificial intelligence on those shortcomings that we know are within the healthcare industry of, you know, cost transparency, payment integrity, efficiency, and you know, basically provider quality. There's still not a lot of data out there on quality of providers. Yeah, yeah. So it's difficult to know if I go to Doctor Smith versus Doctor Jones, who's better. It's the same price, or it's you know totally different. It's, well, it's I go cheaper. with the Smith. That's just me. Smith. I, I, I hear I, Smith is a, a good doctor name. He's good. Yeah, it's a good doctor name. Well, John, I really appreciate it. And we probably went uh, well over an hour, right? Didn't we, Nathan? Yeah. But uh, and I didn't mention the pink uh, pink laces, man. I like the pink laces <laughs> and the shoes. But hey, man, I, you know we'll talk before then. But just want to publicly wish you luck with uh, raising the money for the wells in Tanzania, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro. Please come back in in one piece safely. I don't want to oh, hear yeah, about an ACL well, tear or a broken ankle or or something oh, worse, man. So. Do a good job, work hard, but uh, be safe too, man. I appreciate that. I appreciate John. Great being friends with you too, man. We'll do this again soon. Yep.